All right, everybody, time to settle into session 2.2. Um, we're going to cover, just like in the last class session, we're going to talk a little bit about economics and then about tax law. So uh, you may be, I, I hope you don't need something to keep you awake as we have this conversation. I, I, I will do my best to keep it interesting. Our goals from this class session, I want you to explain how personal income taxes work and then also how the charitable, charitable deduction works in relation to that. Explain why charitable donations are not a normal good. That's an economic term that some of you probably already know. And I want you to articulate why the charitable tax deduction is an economically inferior policy, which may surprise some of you that I'm going to make that case. I want you to be able to explain the elements of the organizational and operational tests. This is where we start getting into tax law stuff. And then finally, know and articulate the differences between the following types of 501c3s, specifically private foundations, public charities, private operating foundations, and supporting organizations. All right, so let's talk about the charitable tax deduction. As most of you know, when you give money to a charity, you can deduct it from your taxes. It's important for us to articulate what that means. If you look at my little graphic on the right, um, you remember I did a version of this when we talked about corporations. The way it works running a corporation is you're only taxed on your profits. So any of the money you bring in that, the, that you then spend on business expenses, or all that money you spend on business expenses is tax-free. That's not how it works as a private individual. The way individual income taxes work, you make money, and by default you have to pay taxes on any of the money you have. It doesn't matter that you spend it. There are no sort of legitimate personal expenses that, that, uh, that justify that sort of make a whole bunch of the money you spend tax-free. In fact, by default, all of your income is taxable. Now, the IRS has, and Congress has, have since carved out specific kind of expenses that are deductible from your taxes or, or that would be non-taxable. So, for example, if I spend interest, if I pay money, if I pay interest on a mortgage, then the amount of money I spend on that interest would be deductible from my income. And so by it, it, with corporations, you make a bunch of money, but all of your expenses are taken away. With individuals, you make a bunch of money, but only certain expenses are taken out of the amount that's taxable. Um, so donations to charity are one of those expenses um, that can be deducted from your taxes. So that's what it means to deduct a, a, something from your taxes. You remove it from the amount of money left that the IRS will use to calculate your income tax. Just a few other personal t income tax items. Deductible expenses are cheaper than taxed ones uh, because the money you spend on those things doesn't carry an income tax. So if I, so if I spend my money on a candy bar and the candy bar costs a dollar, the candy bar actually costs a dollar plus whatever income tax I owe. Now, I'm not talking about sales tax. I'm talking about income tax. So if I buy a candy bar and my income tax rate is 15%, that candy bar actually costs me a dollar and 15 cents. The dollar is um, what I pay to the grocery store or wherever, the convenience store for the candy bar. The 15 cents is the income tax that I have to pay to the federal government. Now, if I spend my money, if I spend that dollar on a donation instead, the donation doesn't cost me a dollar and fifteen cents. It only costs me a dollar. <clears throat> the reason is because I can deduct the donation from my taxes, so I don't owe any taxes on the money I spend on donations. Just on the money I spend on non-deductible things like candy bars. Another observation is that if you take the standard deduction on your 1040 income tax filing, then deductible donations don't count for anything. <laughs> Most of you probably, t well, I don't know, I guess many of you probably do take the standard deduction, though. And when you take that standard deduction, you eliminate any opportunity to claim specific deductions. That would be like interest on your uh, mortgage. Um, it would be taxes, local and state taxes that you pay during the year. It would be um, uh, certain health care expenses above a percentage of your income. Well, charitable donations are also one of those things you would deduct. But if you take the standard deduction, then those donations don't have any tax advantage for you. Um, so if you if you're in the habit of taking a standard deduction, then it should then you can donate your money wherever the heck you want to. There's no tax benefit to giving to a 501c3. You could give it to your to your brother, and uh, and and he could spend it on. Uh, 
on candy bars, and it wouldn't change the taxable effect of the money. Um, finally, last point is that de- deductions are always limited in time and size, uh, meaning that generally deductions have to be declared in the year where it was spent, and they are usually limited as a proportion of your total income, meaning that uh, I can't give away all my money to charity and deduct it all for my income taxes and owe zero tax. There are limits on how much I can give to charity and still have it deducted from my taxes. Okay, so digging into this, we're going to start laying out an interesting economic argument about the charitable tax deduction. And the first thing I want to do is draw some indifference curves. Now, hopefully in your econ class you learned about indifference curves. If you didn't, I'm going to go through this part quickly and then we can dig in deeper in class together. Um, But basically an indifference curve is sort of an indication of your preferences between two choices. So on on one side I might have oranges, on the other I might have apples. And it's going to uh, the indifference curve sort of, sort of shows the trade-offs I'm willing to make between oranges and apples. Now, indifference curves are concave, and the reason is because over time, if you have a lot of one thing, you'd give up a lot of it to get just one of a different thing. If I had 100 apples, I'd give up I don't know, like how many would I give up to get an orange? I'd probably give up at least 20 apples to get one orange. Now, if I had 100 oranges, I might give up 20 oranges to get one apple. So at the extremes, uh, there's a strong trade-off between these items. As you get sort of an even distribution, the trade-off might become more equal. So if I've got 10 apples and 10 oranges, I might give up one apple to get an extra orange. So indifference curves essentially draw that relationship for any possible combination of apples and oranges. Well, here I've drawn the trade-offs between donations and consumption. Basically, the idea is every time you've got a dollar, you have a, you have a choice to either donate that dollar or consume it on your own personal uh, satisfaction. And there's always trade-offs. There are always times where you prefer some donations or times that you prefer some consumption. And this is true for all the income that you have. You have a preference of a certain amount being spent on yourself and a certain amount being spent on other people. Now, these indifference curves, really, I drew three of them, but you can have an infinite set because it can be infinite as it's as infinite as the possible combinations of the two goods you're, you're trading off. So what really matters with indifference curves is the budget line. And a budget line you introduce to illustrate sort of given a fixed amount of money or fixed amount of these goods or fixed budget then what is the maximizing trade-off? Like, where do I get the most satisfaction? And so with this budget line, here's the satisfaction. Here's the distribution point. So I'd be spending X amount on consumption and X amount on donations is the idea. Now, um, this isn't true to life because this indicates that you spend more on donations than consumption, and most people do it the other way around, but you get the idea. So most people consume so so the idea is you, for any given amount of money, you're going to consume to a certain level and donate to a certain level. So the question is, what happens if we make donations cheaper but not consumption cheaper? Well, we'd have to change the budget line. And the budget line will go up on the donation side, but it would stay the same on the consumption side. It would be a line that looks a lot like this. This is a budget where donations all of a sudden became cheaper. Now, if you're wondering how in the world do donations become cheaper, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The spoiler answer is that it's through taxes. You can change the cost of donations by changing tax rates. But uh, the basic idea here is that we've made donations less expensive relative to consumption. Now, when that happens, it would predict that we'd spend more on donations, right? In fact, distribution point two kind of shows that. I would consume a little bit less, and I would donate a little bit more. So the question is, if we make donations cheaper for people, do we really get more people spending their money, donating their money? Because that's the basic idea. If donations become cheaper, do people donate more? That's the question we're going to try to answer. Now, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not this actually happens. And economists are sort of all over the map as they've tried to study this. This is a very hard thing to study empirically. And so, in fact, the evidence I'm going to give you is in no way complete. But I think it is persuasive. Okay, this is a chart from 1997. I know it's about 16 years old, but it still has great insight. And what it shows is that um, <clears throat> this is the distribution of, of donations measured in billions of dollars according to income quintile. So at the, at the left-hand side, you have the lowest 20% of Americans in terms of income. At the right-hand side, you have the highest income levels, the highest 20%. 
Okay. And then the different colors on the bars, the white illustrates how, ma how many donations were donated by non-itemizers. So these are people that took the standard deduction on their taxes. And then the dark gray indicates itemizers. So these are people who took a, um, who, who itemized their taxes so they could count things like their donations or interest, mortgage interest or things like that. Now I want you to notice something. On the left-hand side, the people down in the lowest quintile or even the second lowest quintile, most of them don't actually itemize their taxes. They take the standard deduction. And that's because the standard deduction works better for them and it gives them a better tax outcome than if they were itemizing. Most of these people are probably renters, for example, so they don't have mortgage interest to deduct from their taxes. But as you move across to the right, you'll notice more and more people donate and they do itemize their taxes, meaning they can deduct the full amount they donated from charity or the, the, the amount they donated to charity, they can deduct that from their taxes. Okay, so all right, with that in mind, there's another thing to point out. If you'll notice, the people in the highest bracket, the highest, tw the richest 20% of Americans donate more to charity than everybody, than the other 80% combined. So the richest 20% of Americans donate more to charity than the other 80% combined. So really, most donated dollars in the United States, the majority of donated dollars in the United States come from wealthy Americans. Okay, now, moving on. <clears throat> this is the change in tax rates over a roughly 40-year period. Um, and at the top, you can see how high, at the left-hand side and at the top of the chart, you can see how high tax rates were for the wealthiest Americans. And then over time, you can see how those tax rates sort of dropped. Now, here's what this predicts. Here's what's important about this. As the tax rate goes down, that makes donations relatively more expensive than they used to be. And that's because the difference between donated dollar, the cost of donated dollars and the cost of regular dollars gets smaller. For example, back in 1960, if I was in the richest 0.01% of taxpayers, then if I keep a dollar, for every dollar I keep or spend on myself or a candy bar or whatever, it actually costs, there's actually about a 70% tax rate on top of that. So the candy bar that I described before, it would actually cost me $1.70. A dollar goes to the grocery store or convenience store. 70 cents goes to the government in income taxes. But what you can see is over time, those high in income tax rates dropped until finally in the 2000s, you had uh, them under 40%. And, and that's a big deal because what it means is people should have been donating less during that time period. Like over this big change where the wealthiest Americans would give the most to charity, those people should have started donating less. If our theory that we've built is right, if you make donations cheaper or more expensive, it should change how much people donate. Well, if you look at this chart, this would predict that those really, really wealthy Americans will be donating less to charity because the tax benefit is smaller by donating to charity. Okay. Well, the question is, is that true? And now this next chart shows basically the same time period, uh, roughly the same time period anyway, during which those tax rates change dramatically. And what you can notice is that donations as a share of GDP did not actually change all that much. For whatever reason in the United States, for as long as we've tracked it, we people donate about 2% of their income. And uh, this is basically evidence that... Um, tax rates probably don't influence whether or not people donate to charity, which in turn means that the tax deduction may not be as powerful a policy as we think in encouraging people to donate to charity. This is a really big deal because right now Congress, for the last year or so, Congress has been batting around the idea of getting rid of the charitable tax deduction or at least changing it. And charities have come out of the woodwork to tell their Congress people, no, don't touch it. It's important without it. In fact, Elder Oaks went and testified before Congress, for, before a Senate committee, to encourage Congress to continue providing tax benefits to um, charitable donations. But the deduction is a terrible way to incentivize. It's not, well, I'll put it this way. It's not the most efficient way to incentivize giving. Let me illustrate why. By summarizing my argument, basically, it's important to understand what a normal good is. A normal good is a good where if you have more income, you buy more of that thing. So 
you know, this is true for all kinds of stuff like housing. You'll buy a bigger house if you have more money. So housing is a normal good. There are some things called inferior goods or Geffen goods where as you have more money, you'll buy less of that thing. So, for example, if you, uh, um, you know, when you're poor, you buy lots of top ramen noodles. I and mean, as you get wealthy, wealthier, you buy less of them. That's called an inferior good or a Giffen good. <coughs> Giffen good. Now, if um, now with normal goods, as income goes up, consumption goes up. So this is true for donations. As people give more to charity, or as people get richer, they give more to charity. So this is true. But the same, but but there's an inverse version of this, which is with normal goods, as the price goes down, consumption goes up. So consumption goes up as your income goes up. Well, if the price goes down, it's kind of like you have an income increase for that thing, right? If 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 apples are half off, well, it's like you have extra income to buy apples with because apples cost half as much. With a normal good, if the price goes down, consumption goes up. And that is false for donations. And we showed that by showing the tax rates. As as prices went up or down, people didn't donate less or more. The, the giving was actually relatively static when you change prices. And so in this sense, it violates the definition of a normal good. Because when the price goes down for donations through a tax rate change, the consumption doesn't go up. And the reverse is true. When the price goes up on donations through tax rate changes, the consumption doesn't go down. And it should, but it doesn't based on the evidence that I showed you. <clears throat> now, research on this has shown some interesting effects when it comes to pricing and donations. First of all, probably one of the better studies out there on this topic has found that people do donate more to charity when tax rate changes occur. But that's just, but it's just a timing thing. So in the short run, if you bring in a tax change, people will donate more or less based on the tax change. But then over the long term, the giving stays stable, and so it actually, so taxes don't actually, tax rates don't actually change the long run level of giving. But here's another completely separate study that's really interesting when it comes to prices and donations. And this is a study done by one of my, two of my favorite economists. And I hope you all have a favorite economist because you really should because um, they're smart people. Maybe your favorite economist is Professor Turley or Professor Walters, depending on who you had for econ. But my, my two favorite economists are a guy named Dean Carlin and John List. Professor Turley actually studied under John List. John List was his advisor, his PhD advisor. But anyway, um, they did this really cool study where they had a charity send out uh, mailers to people asking for donations. And they actually broke the groups that received these mailers into four categories. There was a group that just received a, an appeal saying, hey, give us money. There was a group that was offered a one-to-one -one match in exchange for their donations where the charity said, hey, if you donate a dollar, then we have a donor who will match it by a dollar. Then there was another group that was offered a two-to-one match and a last group that was offered a three-to-one match. Now, if you're matching people's donations, it's like you make their donation cheaper, right? Because if I give a dollar and it's matched by a dollar, it's like there's a 50% discount on giving to charity because I'm getting double the bang for my buck in terms of donations. Well, what's fascinating is that the existence of a match affected people's participation. So it, the fact that a match was offered increased the likelihood that people would donate. But what's important is that the one-to-one -one match had the same effect on giving in terms of frequency of giving and amount given as the two-to-one and three-to-one matches. So the existence of a match mattered, but the three-to-one match was basically wasted on people. They didn't care that it was a three-to-one match. They just cared that a match existed, which tells you that people are not very price sensitive when it comes to donations. And so a way to describe this would be to say that, that donations are income elastic, all right, which means that as income goes up, donations go up. Or as income goes down, donations go down. But donations are price inelastic, which means as prices change, donations don't actually change that much. All that summarized basically means that charitable donations are not a normal good because they're income elastic, but they're not price elastic. They're price inelastic, which makes them not a normal good. OK. So let's talk about some alternatives to the charitable tax deduction, because I've told you the tax deduction is a bad policy. Let me illustrate why. Again, here's our distribution of donations. Wealthy people give the most to charity, the more than the other 80% of America combined. Well, this is what happens with that. 
the blue line, the blue part of my chart shows how much a person gives to charity, and then the green part shows how much the federal government gives them back through a tax decrease. And so if you're a person who doesn't itemize your taxes, you give $10,000 to BYU, guess what? Congratulations. You were so kind and generous, but the government doesn't care. Because if you don't itemize your taxes, then the government's not going to provide any tax incentive for your donation. If you're in the 15% tax bracket, like a lot of Americans are, then if you give $10,000 to charity, the IRS gives you a $1,500 reduction in your taxable burden, which is sort of like giving you $1,500 back. And that means your donation really only costs you $8,500 instead of $1,500. <clears throat> now, if you're in the 36% tax bracket, we're going to be even more generous to you because $6,400 of your dollars actually go to charity, but then the government is giving you $3,600. Or another way to think about it, rephrasing, is that they're giving $3,600 to the charity of your choice um, sort of indirectly through this tax benefit. So what this says basically is if you're wealthy, we like your donations better than if you're poor. <coughs> Why does this matter? Well, because of the way marginal tax rates work, donations by the wealthy are subsidized more than donations by the poor. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really the effect we want? Is this how we want to incentivize donations? Uh, I'm not sure that that's the case. Let me give you another example. If you have a mortgage, you're more likely to itemize, and this means that donations of homeowners are subsidized more than those of renters. So if you're a renter, we don't care as much about your donations as if you are a homeowner. Now, that's not directly true. It's not like Congress set out to write this particular effect into the law, but this is the net effect by using the charitable deduction rather than some other incentive for donations. And then finally, last observation, if you live in a city with high taxes, you're more likely to itemize. And this means that donations of people in high-tax cities are more subsidized than those, of, those who live in low-tax cities. So if you live in New York or San Francisco, which are expensive cities to live in, then we like your donations better than if you lived like somewhere in Iowa, for example. Okay. So, so I hope I've made a good case against the charitable tax deduction. Uh, these last three points actually come from an economist who published a great piece and a great op-ed describing why he thinks this is an inferior policy. Let me show you what some others have proposed as an alternative. This is essentially a tax credit scheme instead. Now, the way a tax credit works is this actually reduces the taxes you pay, not just the taxable income that the IRS is going to use to consider. Deductions come out of your income, and then the IRS taxes what's left. Tax credits just go straight against the actual tax amount that you owe. And so... Here what we've done is we've created a 15% uh, credit for all donations that are over a 2% level of your income. So if you give more than 2% of your income to charity, the government's going to reimburse you 15% for your donations. And this is true no matter how much your income is. <coughs> so if you make $30,000 a year and you give um, – 2% of your income to charity, well, that's $600 you give to charity, but we don't give you a tax credit in that case. But if you donate 10% of your income, you're given $3,000 to charity, and the government will give you back $360. Uh, middle income with $60,000 a year, you can see those numbers. Basically, if you give 10% of your income to charity, you get $720 back from the federal government, which, by the way, is more generous than what you would normally be getting. Uh, with the tax deduction scheme. And then finally, if you make a million dollars a year, you give 10% to charity, we'll give you $12,000 back. Now, the Congressional Budget Office actually did a study on this particular tax scheme. And what they found is it didn't actually change donation. They predicted that it wouldn't actually change the donation rates all that much. Charities wouldn't be worse off. And more importantly, the government would be handing out a bunch of tax breaks that they don't need to hand out to encourage the right level of donations. All right, so we'll dig into this, and I'll answer your questions, and I hope this is instructive. I need to get through the rest of this now. Section 501c3 is where we're headed, and these are essentially um, all charitable organizations under the tax code. Now, as far as 501c3 status is concerned, all 501c3s have to pass two tests. 
the organizational test and the operational test. The organizational test essentially incorporates all of the governance requirements associated with um, uh, being a charity. So we're going to look at like your documents and how you're organized. And then the operational test is about what you do every day. Let's talk about the organizational test first. The IRS is going to know if you pass this test by looking at properly executed, legally enforceable organizational documents. Now, I want you to stop and think. What would be properly executed, legally enforceable organizational documents for a charity? Well, the short answer is um, bylaws and articles of incorporation, which you already learned about. If you do it right, the IRS is going to find four of these these following four things in your in your bylaws or articles. They're going to find a dissolution clause. Now, in the text here, I include actual text that would satisfy the IRS requirement. Um, but uh, the highlight is essentially this clause says that if you dissolve, then all the remaining assets of the charity will go either to another charity or to the government. The enormous clause says that you can't hand out assets of the corporation to people in a way that looks or acts like shareholders or ownership. The purpose clause simply says that you'll operate for a charitable purpose as defined by the IRS. So this is limiting your purpose. Notice how this is now less broad than the whole, like, we our purpose is to engage in any and all lawful activity. And then finally, the political activity clause essentially says that you won't engage in any politicking and only insubstantial lobbying. The operational test is different. There are three things I want you to understand. This first one is not new to you. If you're a charity, you have to operate to benefit a charitable class. And we talked about this when we talked about charitable trusts. Charitable classes, remember, have to be indefinite persons. The activity has to be what the IRS considers charitable. So, for example, a fund to raise money for a particular person's surgery, like my, my next-door neighbor's daughter, that's not operating for a charitable class because the daughter is not an indefinite class of person. She's a specific person. The commensurate test is kind of hard to pin down. Um, it basically says that your expenditures have to be commensurate in scope with your resources. There's no mathematical test here. Essentially, the idea is that you have to spend your money in reasonable ways. It's kind of like a, a backstop rule that the IRS can use for really abusive charities. So if you spend all your money on fundraising, you probably violate the commensurate test. And then finally, the business activities test. Um, this says that you can only engage in an insignificant level of business activity. So if you're a charity and you're making money through means that uh, are not themselves charitable, like if the activity is not charitable, then you violate the business activities test because you make too much what's called unrelated business income. Now, if you make any unrelated business income, it's taxable, even if you keep your tax exempt status. An example of really commonly taxed UBI is uh, the money made from selling advertising. So if you're a nonprofit that has a newsletter and then you sell advertising in the newsletter, that uh, the advertising revenue is almost always considered unrelated business income. And if that's too significant as a source of income relative to all the other money you make, then you could lose your tax exempt status. Now notice it doesn't matter how you spend this money, it matters how you make this money. You have to make it in ways that would be considered a charitable activity. So if, a, so if DI is selling um, goods and services to low income people, that is a charitable activity. And so even though they're making money off of selling stuff, the way they're making it furthers their charitable purpose. And so it's appropriate. The same would be true of like selling admission to a museum or tickets to a symphony hall or tuition for a university. Now, so if you're a 501c3, you have to pass both of those tests. There are four different kinds of 501c3s. Now, I know it feels like we're going down the rabbit hole here, but that's just the way it works. First of all, as far as private foundations, so the first category, the first type of 501c3 is a private foundation. By default, all 501c3s are private foundations unless they can qualify as public charities or some other type of entity. Generally, public private foundations are charitable vehicles for families and companies. So people giving money away usually organize as private foundations. But this is the, the worst 501c3 status to have. That you don't want to be a, a private foundation if you can avoid it. There are a lot of reasons. I'll show you them kind of throughout the discussion. But uh, at least 50 per one of the examples is if you're a private foundation, you have to give away 5% of your total assets every year. 
And if you don't, you're going to be penalized by the IRS. A lot of family foundations mess up on this. And when December rolls around, their accountant calls them up and says, hey, you guys need to give away $50,000 before December 31st. Otherwise, we're going to get penalized. And so they hurry to give the money away and usually not to a very good cause, at least not the worthiest cause. So um, to kind of illustrate the differences between these four types of 501c3s, I'm going to bring up this little table. And so what you need to know is that private foundations, they, they, they have limits on how contributions can be deducted from taxes. That 30-20 basis only thing, we're going to cover that in class together because it's easier to explain in person. As far as expenditures go, you, if you're a private foundation, you have to spend your money in documented, contract-bound, charitable purpose ways. In fact, the IRS is going to scrutinize how you spend your money if you give it away to people that may not look charitable. And so you, you have, usually have to have contracts supporting the way you give your money away as evidence to the IRS. Um, private foundations have to pay taxes. They pay up to a 2% excise tax on all their investment income. So even though they're tax exempt, there's that little tax that they still have to pay on what they make off their investments. And then we've talked a little bit about annuirement. The next class session is all about annuirement. But what you need to know of, in short is that private foundations face a very high standard that's in the, in the tax code. It's called self-dealing. Public charities are the second kind of, of status to have, and this is the best one to have. If you're a 501c3, you want to be a public charity if you can. This is the code section that defines it, but uh, being a public charity happens in two ways. You either qualify as what's called an inherently public activity, meaning you're a church, a school, a university, a hospital, or a government ent entity. All of them, all of these entities automatically get public charity status. Or alternatively, you can qualify through what's called the public support test. And what that means is a third of your income or support comes from the general public. Now, there's a mathematical test that the IRS uses to calculate this, and I'm not going to impose it on you, mercifully so. But the basic idea is a third of your income, your donations, have to come from the public at large. And this is the main reason most private foundations cannot be public charities, because they get their donation from a, a small group of donors. They get all their money from a small group of donors, which means they won't pass the public support test. Now, there is an alternative called the facts and circumstances test where you can say 10% of our income comes from the general public, but here, look at all of our other pu inherently public activities, and uh, then you can sometimes get the IRS to give you public charity status. Well, what is it that makes public charity status so great? Well, first of all, people who give to your charity can, de can have higher deductibility thresholds. Um, your expenditures just have to be for a, a charitable purpose broadly. The IRS does not scrutinize you the same way. There are no excise taxes to pay for your public charity. And finally, as far as annuirement goes, there's a lower standard that the IRS play, applies called private benefit. Okay. There are two other categories to cover, and then we're done. The first one is private operating foundation status. This is where you're a private foundation, but you carry out the charitable activity yourself rather than giving other people money to do it. Um, this is and you, you're, you're a private foundation because you still have a small group of donors or just one large donor. Um, and usually your activities reflect the mission given to you by that donor. So we're not going to trust you as much as a public charity because you have too small a group of donors. But um, because you're carrying out a charitable activity, we're going to be a little more generous to you. And I'll show you ways in just on the next slide. So you're still a private foundation in some ways, but in other ways we'll be a little kinder. A supporting organization is kind of like, you can think of it almost like a charitable subsidiary, meaning that you have a parent that is a charity. And so if you're a supporting organization, you have to be supporting the mission of some other public charity. It can't be a private foundation or, or a private operating foundation. It has to be another public charity. But you're supporting their activity. Now, there are three different types of supporting organizations, and I won't make you learn those. But here's the benefit of being a supporting organization or kind of it's kind of like a subsidiary to a public charity. All the tax benefits of being a public charity flow down to the supporting organization, which is pretty cool. So with, with private operating foundations, going back to our chart, we're going to be more generous in deductibility limits. We're not going to make you give away 5% of your assets every year. You have to spend 3%, though, on the charitable purpose. You still have to pay excise taxes, though, and you still have to face the higher self-dealing limits. 
And so we're not going to be very happy about that. But like I said, if you're a supporting organization, kind of like a subsidiary to a charity, <clears throat> then all those charitable purpose, all those charitable, all those benefits tax-wise flow down to you. So you have a higher deductibility threshold. threshold. Um, your expenses do have to be in support of the supporting organization, but that's usually fine with you because that's what you are as a supporting organization. You don't have to pay excise taxes, though, when you have a lower private benefit standard. So some questions we'll talk about. Why in the world do we have four categories of 501c3 status? And does the general public really benefit from having these different categories? And finally, why make charity tax exemptions so complicated? Because with last class session and this class session, you can kind of get the vibe that uh, this is messy stuff. All right, we're done. Sorry, this was a longer class session than normal, um, but uh, it's good stuff, and we'll talk about it in class.